The first question might be, why should you even bother improving yourself? And I think the answer to that is something like, so you don't suffer any more stupidly than you have to. And maybe so others don't have to either. It's something like that. You know, like there's a real injunction at the bottom of it. It's not some casual self-help doctrine. It's that if you don't organize yourself properly, you'll pay for it. And in a big way, and so will the people around you. Now, and you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that. Because if you're in pain, you will care about it. And so you do care about it, even if it's just that negative way, you know. Um, it's very rare that you can find someone who's in excruciating pain who would ever say, well, it would be no better if I was out of this. It's sort of pain is one of those things that brings the idea that it would be better if it didn't exist along with it. It's incontrovertible. So you get your act together so that there isn't any more stupid pain around you than necessary. Well, so then the question might be, well, how would you go about getting your act together? And the answer to that, and this is a phenomenological idea too, it's something like, look around for something that bothers you and see if you can fix it. Now, I often tell people too, fix the things you repeat every day, because people tend to think of those as trivial, right? You get up, you brush your teeth, you, you have your breakfast, you know, you, you have your routines that you go through every day. Well, those, those probably constitute 50% of your life. And people think, well, they're mundane, I don't need to pay attention to them. It's like, no, no, that's exactly wrong. The things you do every day, those are the most important things you do, hands down. All you have to do is do the arithmetic. Let's say you go into a, you can do this in a room. It's quite fun to do it just when you're sitting in a room, like a room, maybe your bedroom, you can sit there and just sort of meditate on it and think, okay, if I wanted to, spend 10 minutes making this room better, what would I have to do? And you have to ask yourself that, right? It's not a command, it's like a genuine question. And things will pop out in the room that you know, you like there's a stack of papers over there that's kind of bugging you and you know that maybe a little order there would be a good thing. And you know, you haven't, there's some rubbish behind your computer monitor that you haven't attended to for like six months. And the room would be slightly better if it was a little less dusty and the cables weren't all tangled up the same way. And like. If you, if you allow yourself just to co consider the expanse in which you exist at that moment, there'll be all sorts of things that'll pop out in it that you could just fix. And, you know, I might say, well, if you were coming to see me for psychotherapy, the easiest thing for us to do first would just be to get you to organize your room. You think, well, is that psychotherapy? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you conceive the limits of your being. And I would say, start where you can start, you know? If, if something announces itself to you, which is a strange way of thinking about it, as in need of repair, that you could repair, then, hey, fix it. You fix a hundred things like that, your life will be a lot different. See, part of what artists do, for example, when Van Gogh paints a room, and you look at it glowing, he's trying to show you what's beyond your perception of the room, and I mean this technically, like the way that your visual system is set up is that whenever memory and presumption can, can, can replace direct perception, it will, because it's simpler. So you literally see what you expect to see. And if what you see is dull and drab and boring and pointless and, 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 and uninspiring, then that's you. It's not what's there and what the artist does when he or she re-represents that mundane reality is to remind you of what's behind it, the potential that's there. And so what I'm suggesting to people is that they take the potential that's right in front of them. It's like, okay, and here's the rule. You're aiming up. There's something that you could change, that you would change. That might be a very small thing. Could, well, that's within the grasp of your power. Would is within the grasp of your will. To combine those two things might be a very small shift. You might only be willing to make a very tiny step forward. It's like, fine, good enough. Make a tiny step forward. And that makes you a slight bit stronger than you were before. And then the next step can be slightly larger. And it's, it's the path of humility. If people look at their lives, you know, it's a very interesting thing to do. Uh, I, like the, I like the idea of the room because you can do that at the drop of a hat. You know, you go back to where you live and sit down and think, okay, 
I'm going to make this place better for half an hour. What should I do? You have to ask and things will just pop up like mad. And it's partly because your mind is a very strange thing. As soon as you give it a name, a genuine aim, it'll reconfigure the world in keeping with that aim. That, that's actually how you see to begin with. And so if you set it a task, especially, you have to be genuine about it, which is why you have to bring your thoughts and emotions together and then you have to get them in your body so you're acting consistently. You have to be genuine about the aim. But once you aim, the world will reconfigure itself around that aim, which is very strange. Be careful what you aim at, right? It, what you aim at determines the way the world manifests itself to you. And so if the world is manifesting itself in a very negative way, one thing to ask is, are you aiming at the right thing? Now, you know, I'm not trying to reduce everybody's problems to an improper aim. People get cut off at the knees for all sorts of reasons. You know, they get sick, they have accidents. There's a random element to being, that's for sure. But, and so you don't want to take anything, even that particular phrase, too far. You want to bind it with the fact that random things do happen to people, but it's still a great thing to ask. And so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day, you're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal, you, you do that, you do that in some sense as a unique individual you want to you want to specify goals that make you say oh if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts it would clearly be worthwhile okay well this is what i'm aiming for how does that instantiate itself day to day week to week month to month and that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful google calendar it's like make a damn schedule and stick to it okay so what's the rule with the schedule it's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Maybe 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that, just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you gotta work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know. So maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero, right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week or 50 and a half percent for God's sake, or because you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. And so, so that's one way that you can work on your conscientiousness is plan a life you'd like to have. We're built for a burden and we're not happy without that burden. And we want to find the one that suits us. And that's difficult. It's, it's part of the adventure of life to seek out the burden that suits you. But when you have that, then yes, then hopefully you're operating in harmony with, with the requirements of those around you. You make yourself a reasonably morally respectable individual. And so now you're not blinded as much by your own proclivity for uselessness and malevolence. And then you can integrate all that. You can integrate all those rules. And, and that's the beginning of the development of character. And then you can 
then you can embody you can embody the union of the rules it's something like that well the mission is the mission is the improvement of your character the constant improvement of your character and I think a lot of that's done in dialogue with your conscience it's like your conscience is always telling you Socrates said this thousands of years ago your conscience is always telling you what you shouldn't be doing and one of the things Socrates said was what discriminated him from the run-of-the-mill person and why perhaps we still know of him so many thousands of years later was that when his conscious conscience told him not to do something he didn't do it he stopped saying the things that he shouldn't have been saying and he stopped doing the things he shouldn't have been doing and that's a start you know that that's a discipline I would say that's the ability to follow a certain kind of intrinsic discipline and, and maybe that's merely the cessation of evil. And that's not exactly the same as the pursuit of positive good. Let's say you haven't got there yet, but that's a start. You, you clear away the obstacles from your vision by ceasing to engage in those activities you know to be wrong. And then the world starts to lay itself out in more pristine form. And then maybe you can start to apprehend what would be positively good instead of merely not wrong. It's psychologically meaningful to pursue the highest of goals and the development of your character, but it's also the best possible thing that you can do practically here and now in the material world to make it less terrible than it might otherwise be. There are times in your life when you're not going to be happy, and then what are you going to do? Your goal is demolished, and there are going to be plenty of times in your life when you're not happy. There might be years and so it's a shallow boat in a very rough ocean and ha and it's 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 based upon a misconceptualization happiness is something that descends upon you everyone knows that you know it 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 comes upon you suddenly and then you should be grateful for it because there's there's plenty of suffering and if you happen to be happy well wonderful enjoy it be grateful for it and maybe try to meditate on the reasons that it manifested itself, right? Because it, it can come as a mystery, you know? You, you don't necessarily know when you're going to be happy. Something surprising happens and delights you. And you can analyze that. You can think, well, I'm doing something right. I'm in the right place right now. I've done something right. Maybe I can hang on to that. Maybe I can learn from that. What you should be pursuing instead is, well, there's two things. It's, you should be pursuing who you could be. That'd be the first thing. It's like, because you're not who you could be, and you know it. You have guilt and shame and, and regret, mm -hmm. and, and you berate yourself for your lack of discipline and your procrastination and all your bad habits. You know perfectly well that you're not who you could be. And God only knows who you could be. And so that's how you should be strive, that's what you should be striving for. And associated with that, you should be attempting to formulate some conception of the highest good that you can conceive of, that you can articulate. Because why not aim for that? It's like your life is short and, and it's troublesome. And perhaps you need to do something worthwhile with it. And if so, then you should do the most worthwhile thing. And you should figure out what that is for you. And part of that's definitely going to be to develop your character as much as possible to dispense with those parts of you that are unworthy. And then maybe, if you're fortunate, and you do that carefully, then happiness will descend upon you from time to time. And that's the best you've got. And then also perhaps during sorrowful times, or worse, evil times, the fact that you've strengthened your character and that you're aiming at the highest that you can conceptualize That'll give you the moral fortitude to endure without becoming corrupted during those times. And to be someone who can be relied upon in a crisis. There's, there's, an, there's an aim. You know, one of the things I've told my audiences, the young guys take to this a lot. I said, you should be the strongest person at your father's funeral, right? Well, that's something to aim for. It's a transition, a generational transition, and it means that, well, all the people around you are suffering because of their loss, 
They have someone to turn to who can illustrate by their behavior that the force of character is sufficient to move you beyond the catastrophe. And you need that. And that's a great thing to, that's a great thing to hypothesize as your aim. And happiness just evaporates as, as irrelevant in light of that sort of conceptualization. The internal problem is, how do you deal with tragedy and malevolence? And you can say, well, I'm not prepared. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Unsurprising, especially if you were overprotected as a child. It's not a good idea to overprotect your kids because the snakes are going to come into the garden no matter what you do. And so then you, instead of trying to keep the damn snakes away, what you do is you arm your child with something that can help them chop them into pieces and make the world out of them. So that the, the trick for human thriving in the face of suffering and malevolence is strength, not protection. It's a completely different idea. We also know this clinically. We know, for example, that if you treat people with exposure therapy for agoraphobia, which is roughly speaking the fear of chaos, I would say, the fear of everything, you don't make them less afraid. You make them braver. It's not the same thing. And the, what, the thing to me is that everything else pales in comparison to that. That's why it says in the New Testament that you should stack up riches in heaven. It's like there isn't anything better than that. You know, you're functioning well, your family's functioning well, you're contributing to your, your community. What you're doing is worthwhile, you know. You're not tormented by your conscience. You're aiming at something that the sacrifices that you have to make are that clearly justify the sacrifices you have to make. Maybe even the sacrifice of your life, because you're in this, like this is a mortal game. You're in this with your whole life. And, and you'd think that what that would mean, at least in part, is that you need to find a game to play that's of sufficient grandeur and nobility so that perhaps even the fact that mortality is built into the structure now becomes justifiable. I mean, it's a hell of a, it's a hell of an ambition, but but I don't, it doesn't seem to me to be something that's impossible. I think you can live your life enough so that it justifies itself despite its limitation. That's the real question. Can you do that? And, and I believe that you can, and I believe that what that means is that the human spirit fundamentally triumphs over death. The world shifts itself around your aim. Because you're a, you're a creature that has an aim. You have to have an aim in order to do something. You're an aiming creature. You look at a point and you move towards it. It's built right into you. And so you have an aim. Well, let's say your aim is the highest possible aim. Well, then, so that sets up the world around you. It, it organizes all of your perceptions. It organizes what you see and you don't see. It organizes your emotions and your motivations. So you organize yourself around that aim, and then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems, and if you solve them properly, then you stay on the pathway towards that aim, and you can concentrate on the, on the, on the day, and so that way you get to have your cake and eat it too, because you can, you can point into the distance, the far distance, and you can live in the day. And it seems to me that that's... That makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. That, that's how, because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Well, and then the issue is, well, back to Noah. Well, all hell's about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile. Because that's what will keep you afloat when, when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that, that you'll drown. Human beings are weird creatures because we're much more activated by having an aim and moving towards it than we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim and that means you have to have an interpretation. And it also means that the nobler the aim, that's one way of thinking about it, the better your life. 
And that's a really interesting thing to know because, you know, you've heard ever since you were tiny that you should act like a good person and you shouldn't lie, for example. And you might think, well, wh why the hell should I act like a good person and why not lie? You know, even a three-year-old can ask that question because smart, smart kids learn to lie earlier, by the way. And they, they think, well, why not twist the fabric of reality so that it serves your specific short-term needs? I mean, that's a great question. Why not do that? Why act morally? If you can get away with something and it, it brings you closer to something you want, well, why not do it? Th these are good questions. It's not self-evident. Well, it seems to me tied in with what I just mentioned. It's like you destabilize yourself and things become chaotic. That's not good. And if you don't have a noble aim, then you have nothing but, but shallow, trivial pleasures and they don't sustain you. And that's not good because because life is so difficult, so much, it's so much suffering, it's so complex, it ends and everyone dies and it's painful. It's like without a noble aim, how can you withstand any of that? You can't, you become desperate and once you become desperate, things go, things go from bad to worse very rapidly when you become desperate. And so there's the idea of the noble aim and it's, it's not something, it's, it's something that's necessary. It's the bread that people cannot live without, right? That's not physical bread. It's the noble aim. And what is that? If you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to, to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. That's a hypothesis, and it's not some simple hypothesis, right? Because it, what it basically says is, if you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. Well, how are you going to find out if that's true? Well, it's a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. There's no way you're going to find out whether or not that's true unless you do it. So no, no one can tell you either, because just because it works for someone else, I mean, that's interesting and all that, but it's no proof that it'll work for you. You have to be all in in this game. All right, so you're always in one of these little frameworks and there's just no getting out of it. So, and that's because, you know, at any given moment, this is like, it's like field theory. There used to be psychological theories that talked about the field of human experience, something like that. And this is kind of what that is. This is a field. And basically what happens is you parse out a little part of the world, say, and so, a, 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 an amount you can handle. So let's say it has some duration. You're not aiming at something 50 years in the future. It's because how the hell are you going to do that? You, there's too many variables, you know. So you're aiming at some handleable amount of time and you posit a goal in there and you plot your route and then that tells you what's up and tells you what's down because up moves you towards the goal and down moves you away from the goal and that sets up your motivational framework so that you have something worth attaining you know, that's a really interesting thing to know, too. It's like, why have a goal? Well, it's easy. No goal, no positive emotion. Because you experience positive emotion by noticing that you're moving towards a goal. And so if you don't have a, have a goal, well, you can't have any positive emotion. So you better have a goal. One thing to remember is that if you don't erect a hierarchical structure with, a, with something to aim at, you got no positive motivation because you experience positive motivation in relationship to a goal, not from attaining the goal. That's satisfaction. And besides, it's fleeting. You know perfectly well. You graduate from university, poof, next day you have a problem, which is what do you do next? And that's a, that's a tough problem. It's not like you've solved your problems by winning that game. You just introduced the problem of having to introduce another game. So it's unreliable as a source of positive emotion, but what's reliable is you set a goal and you try to attain it. And then that gives your life, that literally provides your life with meaning. And so you might say, well, what should the goal be? Well, we could start by saying, well, any goal is better than none. And then we might say, well, it should be a goal that other people will let you pursue because otherwise it's going to be kind of difficult. And maybe they'll be even happy to help you pursue it. That would even be better. And maybe it's a goal that would enable you to learn how to pursue other goals while you pursue that goal. Boy, that would really be good. And so you can see that your goal is parameterized 
But that doesn't mean that any old goal works. It means there's some goals that work nicely and some not so nicely. There are playable games and non-playable games. That's a good way of thinking about it. And you want to have a playable game. And there's a lot of them, lawyer, plumber, you know, actor, whatever. They're, they're playable games. And, and it's not obvious which one's better, but it's certainly obvious which ones are sustainable and which ones are worse. And so there's a set of playable games, and you need to extract from that set of playable games a game that suits you. And that would be partly due to your temperament, you know, because extroverted people want to play an extroverted game, and highly neurotic people want to play a safe game, and agreeable people want to play a generous game, and disagreeable people want to play a game that's highly competitive so they can win, and, you know, fine, but they're all within the realm of playable games. The world's way more complicated than a text, and so there's an infinite number of ways that you can look at the world, and so how do we know that any one way is better than any other way? That's a good question. Now, the postmodern answer was we can't, and that's not a good answer, because you drown in chaos under those circumstances, right? You can't make sense of anything, and that's not good, because it's not neutral to not make sense of things. It's very anxiety provoking. It's very depressing because if things are so chaotic that you can't get a handle on them, your body defaults into emergency preparation mode and your heart rate goes up and your immune system stops working and like you burn yourself out, you age rapidly because you're surrounded by nothing you can control. It's very, that's an existential crisis, right? It's anxiety provoking and depressing, very hard on people. And even more than that, it turns out that the way that we're constructed neurophysiologically is that we don't experience any positive emotion unless we have an aim and we can see ourselves progressing towards that aim. It isn't precisely attaining the aim that makes us happy. As you all know, if you've ever attained anything, because as soon as you attain it, then the whole little game ends, then you have to come up with another game, right? So it's, it's Sisyphus. Well, you don't want to suffer so much that your life is unbearable, right? That just seems self-evident. Pain argues for itself. I think of pain as the fundamental reality because no one disputes it, right? I mean, even if you say that you don't believe in pain, it doesn't help when you're in pain. You still believe in it, right? It's, 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 you can't pry it up with logic and rationality. It just stands forth as as what the fundament of existence, and that's actually quite useful to know. Say, well, you don't want any more of that than is absolutely necessary. And I think that's self-evident. And then you say, well, wait a minute, it's more complicated than that. You don't want any more of that that's necessary today, but also not tomorrow and not next week and not next month and not next year. So however you act now, better not compromise how you're gonna be in a year because that'll just be counterproductive. That's part of the problem with short-term pleasures, right? It's like act in haste, repent at leisure. Everyone knows exactly what that means. So you have to act in a way that works now and tomorrow and next week and next month and so forth. And so you have to take your future self into account. And human beings can do that. And taking your future self into account isn't much different than taking other people into account. There's no better pathway to self-realization and the ennoblement of being than to posit the highest good that you can conceive of and commit yourself to it. And then you might also ask yourself, and this is definitely worth asking, is do you really have anything better to do? And if you don't, well, why would you do anything else? And the probability is that if you manifest yourself properly in the world, that those things will come your way is extraordinarily high. And I believe, I believe that that's exactly right. I mean, I, I, I've watched people operate in the world, and I would say that there is no more effective way of operating in the world than to conceptualize the highest good that you can and then strive to attain it. There's no more practical pathway to the kind of success that you could have if you actually knew what success was.